Good evening. Welcome back to our second edition of Front Page Close-Up with Robert Spencer, a leading scholar of Islam. Robert, welcome back to the program. Happy to be back, Jamie. We're, we, we left the last program. This is something that's confused me a, a bit. We see these Islamic terrorists who hate the West, and yet as we uh, finished off in the last program, they were drinking, they were mm. going to strip joints, etc., etc. What's the deal here? If they hate the West, and hate all these quote-unquote perverse values, and they want to be pure, why are they themselves engaging in it? Two possible reasons. One is uh, they might have thought that they were being tracked by law enforcement and that it would throw them off, and that they would think, oh, these guys are just party boys and they're not really interested in waging jihad. Or, and I think this is actually more likely, they thought that uh, because they were going to engage in this great act of jihad martyrdom that uh, it would outweigh any bad mm. deeds that they committed and so they could do whatever they wanted. Is there a possibility that, as I read in a great book, United in Hate, that when the radical Muslim feels himself infected by desire and by these quote-unquote Western things, he thinks the only way to purify himself is through jihad and violence. Well, see, this is a problem. This is a big problem that uh, is largely Because it's mostly the westernized Muslims that yeah. are engaged in jihad, correct? Because, see, there's no, uh, there's no absolution, there's no reconciliation uh, of that kind in Islam. You know, in, if you're Catholic and you go to confession and you uh, are absolved of your sins, there isn't anything like that in Islam. The Quran teaches that if your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, you'll go into paradise, and if your bad deeds outweigh your good deeds, you'll go to hell. And so if you do a lot of bad deeds, the only way to out make sure that you're not going to go to hell is to do some good deeds that will outweigh the bad deeds. Jihad being such a great act, the greatest of all acts, according to Muhammad, it's something that will outweigh the bad okay, deeds. Okay, Robert, this is another thing that confuses me a bit. You know, when, I, when I've read the Quran and Islamic theology, Allah seems to be a very angry God. Oh, yeah. But why is he so angry? And, <laughs> you know, there's the, like the notion of a loving God doesn't really seem to be in Islam. And no. why would a God want you to blow yourself up among innocent people? Well, this is the big problem that uh, is the core difficulty with Islam that uh, the God that they present is not really a good or loving God, but someone who glories in death and mayhem and destruction But Robert, but when you say this, like for instance, I, I have had a gazillion exchanges with Muslims, whether it's my acquaintances or taxi drivers, and they get angry when you say a lot of these things that are in the, in the Quran itself. Like yeah. for instance, I'm a Christian. If somebody said to me, Lazarus was raised from the dead by Jesus, I wouldn't start getting upset because it's in Luke and Matthew, etc. Yeah. But when I've approached some Muslims and said, Muhammad was a violent man or preached violence, they get mad and say, Muhammad never touched the hair on a person's head. But in the history and in theology and in the Quran, it's, it's clear that Muhammad is a military warrior. Yes. Why do, they, why do a lot of Muslims get upset and deny <coughs> that, let's say, Muhammad was a military man and engaged in violence, but yet it's in the theology itself? Well, they might not know, because okay. most Muslims in the world today are not Arabs. And yet, if you're going to pray as a Muslim, you've got to pray in Arabic. If you're going to read the Quran, you've got to read it in Arabic. So they don't know about their own religion? It's very possible. And how about the ones that do know? Then they, they might not want you to know. And okay. they might think that uh, this is something, because there's such a sharp dichotomy in Islam between the believers and the unbelievers. And the idea in Islam, in the Quran itself, that when you're under pressure, if, the, if, if you're threatened or under difficulty, then you can deceive the unbelievers and conceal the true nature of the faith. And okay. so this is something so that they might be So let's get to one of the most sensitive in. issues. I have to be so careful when I mention this, because, I mean, you might even get killed, but the issue of... Muhammad and Asha, this nine-year-old girl mm -hmm. that he mar quote unquote married when she was nine, uh, sorry, six, and then quote unquote consummated with her when she was nine, and some other words could be used to describe that. But a lot of the Muslims, even if I mention this, I mean, I could get killed for even bringing it up. But is this a Western lie? Is this a lie started by non-Muslims? 
This is in the Islamic theology itself. Yeah, this is in the Hadith, the canonical okay. Hadith that Muslims consider to be reliable. Okay, so in the Islamic Hadith, this is what they say about Muhammad. In the, most, in the, in the Hadith collection Bukhari, that's considered most reliable by Muslims, it is said several times that Muhammad consummated his marriage with Aisha when she was nine. Okay, but, there, but, but a prophet could not possibly do this if he is a man of God or a prophet, etc. So obviously, muftis and imams and clerics around the world have come forward and categorically rejected this to be not true. Yeah, they do that for Western consumption because they know that Westerners find that repulsive. So they say it's not true. But actually, yeah, sure, I've, heard, I've had many Muslims tell me it's not true. But the problem is, Muslims in the Islamic world clearly do believe it's true. The Ayatollah Khomeini, when he took power in Iran in 1979, one of the first things he did was lower the legal marriageable age of girls to nine in so imitation of Muhammad. So they're following the example of Muhammad. In Afghanistan, half the girls uh, over the age of like second grade or third grade are married, and almost all of them after that. But why would? But why do a lot of the Muslim Muslims and Muslim leadership get angry at when this issue is they raised? They get angry in the West. They get angry when you raise it in the West because it's raised in the context of what they perceive to be an attack on Islam and they don't want you to know about it. And but they, what if a Muslim came forward in the Islamic world and said it's time to have an honest look at this issue and organize like a great symposium and, and discredit those Hadiths? Probably his life would be under threat. How would the people threatening him legitimize what they're doing if it's terrible to sexually abuse a young They don't think about it that girl. way. They think about Muhammad as the excellent example of conduct, as the Quran calls it. Where are the leftist feminists in the West protesting what this part of the Islamic theology? Well, you know, Jamie, one thing we've learned in this uh, great uh, new struggle with Islam since 9-11 is that uh, multiculturalism trumps feminism. But you would think that if there's a the theology out there that says that a prophet abu uh, you know, married a young girl when she was six and consummated when she was nine, and this is an example to others in their religion and they're following it, you would think that Western feminists would be adamantly and vehemently protesting. You would think. This. But they're not. They're not. Because multiculturalism is more important to them. Yes than women's rights. Yes, clearly. Because, okay. uh, you know, they, they, they act on what they think is most important. And I've even uh, written for Front Page, as you know, about feminist authors in the United States who make excuses for the oppression of Muslim women. Mm -hmm. And they uh, try to explain it away. Mm -hmm. um, Robert, um, and so what, what has been, what is your greatest response to this then? How, what do you say, what does this mean about Western feminism? That it shows that their movement is entirely hypocritical and hollow at its center. Okay, before we leave our second segment, uh, we've had some readers write in uh, to answer some of our questions, uh, to ask you some questions. And I selected two or three of the best ones. They might be a little bit silly, but there was a large volume of them. Okay. If you are anti-Islam, and it is Islamic to wear a beard, why are you contradicting yourself in wearing a beard? <laughs> Sorry, that one was a very, I had a couple of those. Is, I love that, have, I love that. Do you have any answer? No, I'm stymied, I guess I'll have to shave it off. No, actually, uh, obviously beards are not exclusively Islamic and uh, I am pro-human rights, I'm not anti Would that pass as an Islamic beard though, or it's too it's short? It's a little short for that. Next one, don't you care that you might be hurting Muslims' feelings when you point out bad things about their religion, how would you like it if someone said something bad about your religion? People say bad things about my religion every day, and somehow I soldier on. Uh, it just doesn't matter to me. You know, we have to be a little bit more uh, mature about this than the, uh, than the Muslims in the world seem to be willing to be. Uh, the, the, uh, any, any religion or political philosophy or any kind of system of thought has to be open to criticism, has to be open to critical scrutiny. Are you saying there has to be the right to offend for in, or, in order for a free society of to Of course. If, we, if there's any belief system that's off limits for criticism, then we're on the road to tyranny and we're on the road to the hegemony of Are that Are we on system. that road? Yeah. Are you pessimistic? 
No, I, it ain't over till it's over. I'm, I'm okay. going to keep fighting and die uh, on my feet. We're going we're gonna, to uh, bring an end to this second part of Front Page Close-Up with Robert Spencer. Join us for the third and final segment tomorrow evening of Front Page Close-Up.